This week, we welcome Tony Cole. He's the Chief Technology Officer at Ativo Networks. He's coming on for an interview to talk about a brief history of deception and its applicability to cybersecurity. In the enterprise news, Newstar is in the news with some new fraud detection capabilities. Um, almost half the containers in production have vulnerabilities, according to one report. BlackBerry is offering its security technology to IoT device makers, and Radware makes an acquisition. So stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, your contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observant combats insider threats by detecting risk activity, investigating in minutes, effectively responding, and stopping data lost. Give it a test drive at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. This is episode 121 for January 9th. 2018. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Good to see you in the new year, Paul. Just happy to be here, and I'm ready for winter to be done, I think. <laughs> yeah. We haven't, you know, I don't want to jinx us, knock on wood. We haven't had that bad of a winter here in Rhode Island, but... Well, in, I haven't been out South there Dakota, yet, the studio. You know, <laughs> that's true. That's true. If I come out to the studio, it's going to happen. We're going to get like a two-foot snowstorm. It's awesome. Um, so RSA Conference 2019 is, of course, the place to be for cybersecurity, data, innovation, and thought leadership March 4th through the 8th. I will actually be there speaking about, I actually just realized what my topic was. I knew they accepted <laughs> one of my talks. And I didn't know which one. It's actually my one on container security, which will get a facelift and be presented uh, at RSA, which is, uh, which is pretty awesome. John, I know you'll be out there at RSA, correct? I will be. I think I'm presenting twice and I'm running two tables. So it's it's going to be a busy week. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be doing interviews with people. Um, we do have a discount code. Uh, you can go to rsaconference.com forward slash security weekly dash US 19. You can register there and get $100 off with the discount code 5U9SWFD for $100 off. I would like to welcome Tony Cole, who, like I said earlier, he's the Chief Technology Officer at Ativo Networks. He's a cybersecurity expert, more than 30 years of experience. Tony, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. John, appreciate it. So happy to be here. Yeah, nice to, uh, nice to have you, Tony. You've worked in the, in the industry uh, for some time. You've been at FireEye, McAfee, and Symantec. Is that, is that, is that right? That is, and people wonder how that happens. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. really that's really amazing. That's awesome. It must be good to finally step out from the small companies. <laughs> <laughs> I actually ended up at two of those via small companies. So, it's, ah, uh, I see. awesome. It's a uh, it's nice to to be out in the the startup world again, having fun. And so, uh, Tony, tell us a little bit about uh, your role at uh, Ativo Networks today. So I joined a little less than a year ago, March of last year, and I own strategy and vision for the company. So, and that's uh, across the product side, you know, for vision strategy on development of uh, what our platform looks like in conjunction with a phenomenal engineering team we have and product management team uh, and integrating my knowledge of the industry with our customers' vision of where they'd like to see us go, what we know about the threat actors, and tying all that together to actually continue driving us in the uh, in the correct direction, so to have an impact. Fantastic. <clears throat> and now, Tony, you're speaking at InfoSec World coming up, uh, which we haven't mentioned yet, but 
Um, I know I was on the I am on the advisory board for Infosec World. I really like the conference uh, quite a bit. I think it's a great mixture of community and industry coming together. Um, what are you speaking about at Infosec World? Uh, I'm talking about cyber deception as well. So, and uh, I think my title on that one is <laughs> I do these so often it's hard to remember sometimes. Uh, oh, deception, luxury or lifeline. That's what it is. Nice. Um, so, Tony, we want to talk a little bit about the history of deception. Um, you know, Citroen, we talk about this quite a bit on the show. Um, and I think it's really solidified itself as a true category in cybersecurity. However, I feel like there's still a huge percentage of folks out there that uh, still think of it as a honeypot and are very confused about all the different options and what it really means to have some type of deception technology uh, in your network. So, uh, take us through some of the history and kind of uh, how we got to where we are today. Sure. You know, it's it's really interesting that some of the people who still think that deception isn't viable in their environment or some of the ones that have been around for a very long period of time and seem to be stuck in the old ways with many of the legacy security stacks that they have, you know, uh, firewalls, IPS and such and, you know, uh, different gateways and but not really thinking about what new technology can bring to the forefront for them. So deception, you know, uh, to 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 shorten a very long story is really interesting because it's been so successful in the physical realm in having an impact uh, in military battles, in sports, uh, across the board. So when you think about most major military battles, just you know, through many major wars, all the way back to the to the dawn of time for mankind, um, there has been deception as a component to win most of those battles. Probably the latest one, you know, that uh, is very, very famous, of course, was the Ghost Army utilized during uh, World War II <laughs> for D-Day. So to actually use inflatable tanks and this great book on that and uh, a great movie as well that a lot of people aren't aware of. But they literally pretended to be in one place when they actually were attacking in another place, which was uh, just absolutely phenomenal. So what we've done is, uh, you know, we built a deceptive platform to bring that into the cyber realm. When you think about that applicability today, uh, for some reason, people still don't get it on a, on a broad scale until they're introduced to deception, you know, with a one on one or seeing a podcast like yours or, or reading a good book on it. They don't think about the applicability of deception in everything we do. Football fans, you know, today, uh, when they watch their team go out there, that offense is trying to pretend they're doing one thing while in actuality they're doing something else. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know being a, a Patriots fan, I, the, <laughs> the, and of course everyone's going to hate me go. for that, right? But when they do a trick play, um, it's not only fun to watch, but it's a really cool application of deception. Yeah. Um, and some of the like most popular Tom Brady Patriots uh, plays are, in fact, some of those like trick plays. I remember him catching a... a touchdown pass and things like that. Like that's yep. really, really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about like those parallels. And, you know, as you're describing it, Tony, I think about uh, boxing or martial arts where deception is very much part of your strategy, right? Is keeping the other person, you know, not understanding what you're going to do, right? And being deceptive about it is a huge part of, of that sport as well. I just wrote a blog, so using deception to fix the fight uh, late last mm -hmm. year. It's on our website, and uh, that one was a lot of fun because it, it, you, your analogy is absolutely perfect. And when you think about all of the successful major attacks today that come across any enterprise, they all use deception. So why in the world aren't we using deception You know, as a countermeasure and a foundation of an active cyber defense to counter what the adversaries are doing? So it only right. makes sense. Mm. And do you find that attackers are using deception? And do you have examples of, of how they're using it today? Oh, sure. I mean, when you think about most of the successful ways they get in today, you know, a spearfish, deception, you know, you think it's one thing, you know, and in reality, it's, it's another thing, you know, it's uh, either some inject code in it, or, or maybe there's, you know, a weaponized attachment, maybe there's a malicious link in it. So but uh, there's a number of ways just on the spearfishing side. And then uh, you look at waterhole attacks, uh, ransomware, the vast majority of those are utilizing some component of deception. So the user that's impacted, you know, uh, doesn't realize that they're actually being fooled. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I once got funny. into an argument with uh, one of my students on that because I tried to use that same quote at our black hat class on uh, cyber deception. And 
He's like, no, attackers, they don't use deception. And I'm like, when have you ever seen an attacker that sends in an email that says, this is malware. If you click this malware, it will compromise your computer system. That's not, a, that's not an attacker. That's a really frustrated pen tester who's sick and tired of people clicking their links. So yeah, deception is absolutely massive in everything we do whenever we do cyber offensive operations and uh, BHIS too. You know, it's interesting. Uh, my, my kids are getting into the Marvel uh, movies. And I, they were, they've been watching YouTube videos. And all of a sudden, like last night, I'm like, you guys have like an amazing knowledge of all these Marvel movies and characters. And they're like, yeah, we want to watch Black Panther. I'm like, OK. I'm like, yes, I'm on board with that. <laughs> um, it's much better than some of the other kids shows. Right. And yeah. it, it relates to this interview because in some of the early scenes, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the movie. I have. When they steal that hammer in in the beginning, I mean, if you haven't watched the movie, you know, fast forward through this part, right? But they poison someone, and then they bring in uh, the uh, emergency Medics. medical uh, yep. personnel, and then the, the emergency medical personnel kill all the guards, and they steal everything, and they walk out, you know, basically run out and get in the ambulance and drive away. I'm like, wow, if that's not a really great example of how attackers uh, are able to use deception, I don't know what is. Okay. Well, and to take it one step further, that's a really good analogy. You look at espionage for you know many millennia and how it was utilized by nation states against another nation state and the fact that they would just increase the level of sophistication needed to accomplish a goal. Mm -hmm. And when you know the internets came into being, the internet internets, <laughs> when the internet came into being, <laughs> uh, all, all they did was decide you know that this is a much cheaper route mm -hmm. and uh, uh, avenue for them to actually be able to utilize espionage in the online world. And of course, you know we all know that you know organized crime jumped into this space as well. So. Uh, I think anyone not thinking that deception is a component of cyber attacks today is is fooling themselves. Yeah, I, so I, I've got a go ahead, John. I was going to say so. One of the things that we always ask, and you know, sometimes we ask it multiple times, because people dial into this show not just so we can talk about products and things like that, but they like to get some idea about solutions. And one of the things that we like to ask is, do you have a specific narrative or story in mind that was a customer story? where this worked. And I love the cyber deception stories because anytime I talk to any of our customers that are using these technologies, we were just on a test last month and we lit up all of their different deception technologies that they had. And they were so excited because they saw that working where a real app server was coming in and we were hitting a, a, an open telnet server. We were hitting a system that appeared to be uh, vulnerable to an exploit and it absolutely slowed us down and it made them far more accurate in their detection do you have any stories that resonate with you of your customers where they implemented the technology and you're like, that is so cool. That is exactly what we wanted or were you surprised? And I use this as kind of a counter because I think Dark Tangent was in Europe at a conference and cyber deception came up. And as a joke, he said, well, how many people here are actually using cyber deception? It was like two hands that went up and it was kind of used <laughs> as a way of saying, well, see, no one's doing it. So there's no value to it, which, OK, not as many people as we'd like are using it. But I think the more narratives and stories that we give out about success mm. make it far more uh, palatable for organizations to adopt. So what stories do you have? Great point. Great point. I will tell you that uh, it's fascinating to us because the technology we've created is uh, something that we provide to an organization, help them implement it, help them build it into their processes and teach them how to utilize it. And then everything is self-contained and stays in their environment. They only share back what they wish. That being said, we get some great use cases back on follow-ups with them that are just absolutely fascinating. And we're learning more and more each day from our own customers about uh, use cases that we simply hadn't thought of that you know, very creative security professionals have designed. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a customer that uh, uh, had, with, had some problems with a, a uh, unique server that was compromised and i can't provide more details than that because you can figure out who it is a uh, very very large organization in the uh, fortune 500 and they asked us to build this unique deceptive server exactly like theirs and could they utilize that to actually help clean up some ir because the ir team had been working for many months and unable to actually find all the compromised uh, active directory user accounts so and uh, so we built this server for them. They dropped it into place and then announced to their team they had uh, ruled out uh, uh, any malicious insiders. They knew it was actually an adversary in their network that had built uh, multiple beachheads in there. 
So very fascinating that uh, they managed to utilize this and announce out of band to that organization not to go to the server and then announced it on the network and found all the, uh, I shouldn't say all because they're still cleaning up, but nevertheless uh, gave them a, a phenomenal point suddenly to find all these compromised uh, active directory systems. So across the board and start really, you know, uh, doing a significant cleanup. Uh, that's and one so, case. Uh, we've got uh, yeah. a, a large health organization that we built a, uh, a medical infusion pump for them. So uh, that they wanted to decoy for that and dropped it into their environment and uh, set up a brand new, you know, this is maybe, uh, I think it was like nine or 12 months later and they, they built deception into their processes, but they uh, got a brand new x-ray machine that they actually deployed on their network straight from the factory. So and it immediately hit our bot sync, hit that decoy. So, and we actually caught, you know, a, a system that, uh, by the way, had bypassed everything else in their environment, nothing else saw it. So, and it actually started playing in our deceptive environment. We caught it immediately for them. There's a tremendous amount of uh, use cases that we're getting from our customers. It just makes us so much fun. My favorite yeah. thing since I joined this company is hearing CISOs and CIOs continuously say, wow, you guys are so different. You, you know, you come at this from such a different angle which is a lot of fun to not hear someone say, what's your next gen product? <laughs> oh, yeah. But cool. I no. think it's interesting is, uh, you know, having been a systems administrator and a security analyst, I think in us being, you know, people that are in that role very much have that hacker mindset. And I think it's crossed many of our minds that hey, I should deploy a decoy. And when you think about doing that on your own, or if you've ever tried it, Right. There's a lot of shortcomings that I think are solved by having a platform that can allow you to do that in effective, a safer manner, a more accurate manner, because there's just there's so many variables. But like I would love when I was, you know, at a university, for example, to deploy a decoy of some system. And we had a lot of strange systems similar to healthcare and others. It'd be great to have a decoy. Um, but the effort to manage that, create that, make it look real and, and all that is is somewhat overwhelming. Having a platform, I think, is now the way to go. Yeah, but Paul, kind of on that note with a lot of our customers that we recommend moving into the deception realm, it's a hard sell because yes. everybody's caught up in that idea. Well, honeypots, you know, I read a book one day that said honeybots are a waste of time. Right. And I think that some simple things like, you know, creating a honey user in an mm -hmm. active directory, a user that if anybody tries to authenticate to it at all via password spray, trigger an alert. Um, just do some really, really, really simple deceptive technologies, not necessarily to say, hey, this is what our whole program is going to be built upon these open source tools and techniques. But as soon as CISOs and CTOs start seeing that, oh, well, that simple thing that we just did was successful, mm -hmm. I think it makes it a lot easier for pe people to purchase into getting a full platform at that point. Um, does that's that make sense? Point. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's the, the way we use open source software as well. Sorry, yeah. Tony. Uh, I yeah, no, I, I would add to that because because John, I agree, John makes a good point. However, a lot of people don't ri realize how simplified the use of deception has become if you pick the right platform. I give an right. example. Back in uh, 99, 2000, uh, I was running uh, network security at the Pentagon, and uh, I was bringing in honeypots. And that's when I met Lance Spitzner and the mm -hmm. HoneyNet Project guys, and uh, uh, we did a bunch of work together. And my biggest battle was, you know, when it was difficult, was not maintaining and building these bare metal honeypots, you know, uh, was battling lawyers instead, getting permission to turn them on. Right. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, when I left and retired from the military, I joined Recourse Technologies that had the first, you know, commercial honeypot. So terrible name, uh, man trap, terrible name. But anyway, uh, still very interesting uh, that it was a, a, some very difficult times trying to get people to actually adopt that concept. And Symantec acquired the company I was at for a protocol anomaly detection IDS. So, and I stayed there for a number of years, but the point is that, uh, you know, as I decided I wanted to do something different again, I started looking at deception and looked at a lot of different vendors, talked to some uh, VCs and talked to a number of CISOs that had tested and were utilizing deception and found that, uh, you know, the way that this company goes about it, you know, Ativo is very different than many of the other ones. We just recently did a blog on a, uh, on a young woman that actually has a security team of one and how she's using deception to help mature her processes. And it's pretty easy to drop in, you know, a, a bot sync into on-premise or utilize, uh, you know, one of the other variants, you know, AWS, Azure. So some cloud variant doesn't matter, but 
to actually help enable them because very quickly they realize that uh, they they can believe that it's high fidelity alerts coming from this. You tune it properly, so you're not gonna get any false positives. And suddenly now you're starting to see what other tools are effective in your environment and which ones are not. So because now you see what, what everything has bypassed and still actually compromised your environment and you know which tools were supposed to catch what happened and did not. So it, it makes it a lot of fun. And the, com the companies that have a very mature process and a, a really good security team we found that uh, they go to further lengths and they'll increase the complexity of the uh, deceptive environment. So where they're entertaining the adversary at a much deeper level than a, a smaller organization without the processes. So it makes Have it a lot started, of fun is my point. Cool. Have you started cross-referencing your deceptive technology components to something like the MITRE attack technique matrix? Yes, we've actually uh, published a blog on that and uh, we've done it to the NIST cybersecurity framework as well. And uh, we're working on some other control um, structures too. Very cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. It, one of the yeah, other. And, and I'm happy to share that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so one of the other things was I, I think when I look at Ativo is you had some interesting technology support for things like serverless or or cloud. Could, could you kind of expand upon that? Because I think that technology, in my mind, when I first started playing around with containers, I'm like. Well, wow, this makes it really easy now to create deceptive, you know, items. Um, it's still, I felt like I needed a platform. As if you've ever taken an application and put it in a container, it, it you know, that's why I don't have much hair, I think. But, um, <laughs> but there's some really cool technology advancements you've made in in that area. But just so you know, Paul, uh, I stopped coding and my hair came back. So <laughs> there you, you go. Give it a shot. <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> so it was never a really good coder in the first place. So. Uh, more of a, an operations guy and, mm. and uh, uh, that strategy and vision side. Uh, but no, you make a great point. So we've come a long way in a, in a very short period of time. It's a very mature platform. And one of the things that we spend a lot of cycles on is not only looking at the adversary and focusing on the threat intelligence side and where they're going, but also with our customers to see where our customers are going with their environment. So, uh, so we've actually created a deception for serverless environment, deception for containers as well. Uh, and we continue to add components onto that. So as people actually migrate their environment in, in new directions, once there's a decent business case for it. So I think that uh, we'll see more and more in that space as we see more and more customers move that way. That's what led us to the, you know, AWS, Azure, uh, and, and Google side, you know, for uh, for a cloud environment. So as well as we still have a tremendous amount of customers that nope, we want uh, an appliance. Mm. And if I could, gentlemen, I wanted to mention one other thing that I thought both of you would find very interesting. Um, number of conversations with CISOs rolling this out, and one of the things they're continuously ask is, should I announce that I'm rolling out deception in my environment, or right. should I not announce? And we see a pretty broad mix that's a lot of fun. Uh, one organization rolls it out in secret, and they have like 20 people that uh, you know are walked off. So over a few months, and one of them actually involved in the deployment. And we have others that, you know, uh, will go out and say, hey, we're rolling out deception, you know, be good. So follow the policies, even if we don't have a security control, we're watching. Mm, that's really interesting. And so uh, do you use deception for not just, I think we're thinking of as from an external attacker perspective, as is with traditional honey tokens and, and mm -hmm. honey pots, right? But that also has other con um, benefits of internal users either by accident or on purpose do, uh, acting as some kind of insider threat i'm assuming you have use cases there as well right we we have a lot on the insider threat component because we we catch a lot of uh, malicious insiders and we also catch a lot of people that are violating policies and i yeah. want to be clear we don't consume the policies inside our product but instead people can actually if they've got a well-structured system you know and well-defined policies uh, for instance, we all know, you know, what user should be scraping memory and actually utilizing the credentials they find and they head out to a deceptive Active Directory server or uh, or they've stolen a credential off their own system. So when they're actually trying to utilize that to do some reconnaissance in Active Directory or looking at uh, some SMB shares, they shouldn't be. So those are all things that, you know, uh, will capture where it's a policy violation, even though there isn't a security control. So suddenly we've given them a lot more visibility inside. We've got a lot of use cases for that, too. Yeah, and I like that because when I when I think of containers and the cloud and, and serverless, there's a big learning curve that I think largely is an industry we're going through, never mind how to actually produce a container or serverless environment that's secure. I mean, we don't even really know what that 
looks like today because we're still struggling right. with how do we build it. Active Directory is somewhat similar in that there is, I mean, John can tell you, right, and his team or testing organizations all the time, trying to implement all the security controls around Active Directory is a daunting task and an ongoing task. It sounds like deception, it, no matter where you are on the maturity curve, can help you with that. And I think we've traditionally thought of deception and honeypots as, well, you have to be really mature in your security program to take advantage of it. It sounds like that's not true today. Yeah, that's. I actually have a whole presentation on that misconceptions mm -hmm. about deception today because we see uh, a lot of really large customers with, uh, you know, very good security processes that integrate deception into that. So in uh, and tie it in and, and have been very successful at uh, further ramping up their abilities. But we do see a lot of organizations too that uh, have very limited capabilities that uh, very quickly uh, start to find problems inside their environment. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, one that's a kind of a fun use case is uh, we've got a number of customers that have deployed deception in their own environment, liked it, built it into their processes, and as they continue to grow, and this is a uh, one of them's a Fortune 50 company, so they've started utilizing it for mergers and acquisitions as well. Mm -hmm. So here they're buying smaller companies that may not have those processes along, team, along with their red teaming activities. They'll deploy deception in that environment to see how compromised the environment is and where it needs to be cleaned up before they connect it to their own enterprise. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah. And you know, with containers too, we were speaking on a show earlier, I think it was business security weekly about making those decisions to move into a purely hosted container environment, right? It's actually a decision that security weekly we're, we're faced with today. We're doing the kind of baby steps where you stand up a server at AWS and then you put, you know, Docker and containers on top of it because the learning curve to go to something like an ECS uh, from Amazon is, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big learning curve. And I'm like, well, when we figure that out, like how many l hard lessons are we going to learn about security when we do that? Because a lot of effort's going to be put into just getting it in production. Having something like deception in that environment makes it uh, a little easier to make that decision to push into that environment because I think there's a cost savings. I mean, Matt Alderman was saying there's a 25 to 30% cost savings if you're moving into a hosted uh, container or serverless environment for your applications. Very much want to take advantage of that, but some of my hesitation are security concerns. Uh, I would agree with you. You know, it's uh, it's always difficult when you're handing off some of that to, to another organization. Mm. You know, it's fascinating just jumping onto AWS's website and reading all their security uh, manuals that they have in there. There's a lot. Yeah. So we all know everybody in this, you know, um, on this podcast knows that, you know, all the compromises we see around uh, S3 buckets. So that's yep. not Amazon's fault. That's, you know, the, the customer that put it up there. They own the security for it. So that was one of the reasons why it was so important to us to continue to move down that path and do the deception for serverless environments for containers. Uh, we cover S3 buckets as well so that we can actually, wherever a customer is moving, we can touch them with deception and actually look for um, you know, anomalous activity. So, and that's the fun thing about deception when you're building this out. You know, People say, well, how can you show me that the alerts are high fidelity? Well, you know what? It's a, a deceptive decoy system so in any touch of these systems is an anomaly in of itself, and it should be all hands on deck. Mm. So that, or you have a misconfiguration, fix it, and then right back to statement one. Right. Uh, you don't want to say like zero false positives, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, and you're, you're right, because, you know, there, there are false positives here and there. You know, we, none of us can stop, you know, uh, Nick from blowing up uh, somebody actually, you know, whitelisting, so a pen test tool, so uh a red team tool and you know uh, they change IP addresses, they change tools, they do a new plugin. Sure, absolutely. There's going to be false positives here and there. But I'm just saying in comparison to security tools mm. that are out there today that we use on utilize on a daily basis, people generally consider us extremely high fidelity alerts. It's awesome. John, any uh, questions for Tony? No, no more questions. It's just Always happy anytime we get any vendors with cyber deception in play. Paul and I have been behind this for eight years now mm. and uh, just wish you guys the absolute best of luck. Absolutely. Well, appreciate it. And if you hadn't heard, we were uh, number 31. So on Deloitte's uh, fastest growing technology companies in North America. So at the end of 2018. So it's going well. <laughs> it's awesome. And um, uh, I'm assuming people can go to ativonetworks.com uh, and find the blog. You mentioned uh, several blog articles that I think would be interesting for our audience. Yes, uh, ativonetworks.com, and you'll see a link in the top right corner of the page for blog. 
Uh, they can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm no hacking on Twitter and uh, try to stay pretty focused on deception most of the time. Awesome. Tony, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time today. It was fun. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll take a short break. Come back, talk about the enterprise security news. So stay tuned.